I'm going to seed you down with some ideas uh, rather than give you a bunch of uh, numbers that I've been calculating because I really do believe that the situation that the industry is going through today is one of those shock waves that comes before the bigger earthquake and it's telling us something about how the industry is going to be changing over time. Now, I know people are going, the bigger earthquake, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> well, the question is whether you're going to build the buildings, so to speak, the way they did in China before the big earthquake, and they all fell down, or whether from now on we're going to start putting in the kind of reinforcements against what's coming so that when the shaking happens in the future, it's not as devastating. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those things are that are coming and what I see as one way, as an illustration, that we're going to move or can move toward extracting more value from what we're, from what we're doing already. And that always sounds strange to produce our audience ears now, especially out here because, you know, at least though most of you are from North Carolina, but I know many have come in from other places, North and South Carolina. You're the legendary, low-cost, you know, producers. And so it's like, look, we have tried everything. We've extracted all the value we can. Uh, we've probably pulled out too much, as some of the speakers talked about today. So how is it really that we can get more value from what we're doing? And I, I really believe that there's substantial additional value uh, still on the table. And I want to seed you down with an idea about how that may be capturable, if that's a word. The um, to do that, though, we have to slog through just a little bit of some of the bad news that's coming. And then I want to try to turn the, uh, the table a little bit toward some things that, uh, that I think are coming that, that are already illustrated in some other places that you can uh, um, begin applying with your creativity to this industry. Now, um, do we have a clicker thing so I don't have to run back there all the time? Okay. I'll hang close to the podium and duck behind it if you start throwing things. You know, we're, um, we just, you probably saw the news story that we're about ready to be 7 billion people on the earth. And uh, by most projections, we're adding a billion every eight years now. And probably a year and a half ago, there were a lot of speakers, even I heard a guy from Forbes magazine, um, their finance editor, uh, talk about how this was going to be great for agriculture because there were so many mouths to feed and it was growing mouths to feed and man commodities were going to be in demand for ever and foreseeable future for building and for food and all that. And so you dive a little closer into statistics and you find out that uh, something like 95 to 97 percent of that population increase is happening in the poorest places on earth. The places where vegetarian diets where any food is available is in fact uh, you know the dinner fare. The uh, the way that meat consumption, barring some of the other things which are coming to try to slow it down, increases is not by population increase but by per capita income increases in places around the world. So we're not looking at population increases as big export markets in the future for pork. We want to be looking at places where per capita incomes may be rising, especially where they were low to start out with. Now, if we think about that, those seven billion people and another billion coming in eight years, we are truly going to face some kind of crisis with respect to available resources for grain diets even and, and other diets. So there is going to be rationing in some way of the basic global resources required to do anything with, especially produce food. And obviously food, which is one of my patients, uh, one of my bigger patients, as is obvious, um, uh, food is going to be one of those critical reshapers of, uh, of the globe. And it, its availability and its security, especially, and uh, countries that are rich in in uh, resources but food poor, like for instance uh, uh, the Middle East that has a lot of oil wealth but not very much food production capability, 
are already working strategies within the world to try to make sure that they don't get caught short in that picture later on, which I'm sure many of you know. So if we think about what's coming and what you're going to have to respond to so that the first quake here that we're feeling, which is really arising out of this in, in a way, um, don't, doesn't become that big hole in the ground that really you fall into. We need to know something about global resources. We need to know about changing government policy, both in this country and really the global consensus which is emerging, and that is that government policy uh, needs to take a more active role where market forces form formerly were allocating resources. And there are different, definite consequences uh, to how the world plays out depending on where we wind up in that spectrum between government and world government alliance control of what markets do or a more free market solution or any of that continuum in between. Uh, there is certainly now emerging a trend toward more activist government management of available resources. The, the only problem with governments managing anything, of course, is um, historically all you got to do is go get your license plate to know how uh, they don't do even that very well, much less anything else. And the other thing is, obviously, to say that governments are politicized is to be an oxymoron or something like that, redundancy. But they tend to respond to short-term political demands and never look at secondary, tertiary, and uh, consequential impacts of their action, which are often huge and sustained and very hard to get back into the toothpaste tube. So we want to look at that just a hair and, and the basic conditions really that affect food production costs and the demand for food worldwide, part, part of which is uh, growing population but also per capita income issues. So as I look at the future and I read every day and I scan sort of the network that I look at every day as a briefing, I'm looking for evidences of how this question is being decided and how companies are responding to the anticipated decision that seems to be coming down here uh, really throughout the world. Are we running out of world resources really or can we solve the problems that are coming our way through ingenuity and market mechanisms? Uh, that's the big question and I'm saying that maybe not already totally decided but certainly leaning toward uh, not being able to solve it without uh, coordinated global government policy prescriptions. So here are the four, four big issues that, and there are sub-issues of course in each one of them, but population growth, available water, available energy, and the issue of whether or not man-made global warming is taking place and whether you know, restriction of the greenhouse gases is essential to sort of save the planet, however you fall out on that. Uh, unfortunately, again, it's difficult to know much about these with any real certainty because so much of the scientific research that's done about all this is highly politicized. So we're left with not knowing really, uh, but having sort of evidence that's conflicting really in both ways. But the political response to these things is going to be kind of important. Something like water. Um, water is critical, of course, for growing crops. And so when China reaches out into Africa, for instance, and secures a huge amount of land for future production of corn, because it can't produce it self-sufficiently for corn, so it ranges out into the world, into Africa, and takes 99-year leases on arable land that isn't being exploited by Africans uh, to secure its own you know, future supply of, of, um, of feed grains, for instance, for its livestock production. It makes itself more secure by unplugging a little bit from the vagaries of the global market and having to be dependent on export markets. And it's also acquiring water rights and water resources. And one of the things that I think is may not be as far off as you think is you're going to be calculating not just feed gain, feed to gain efficiencies and things like that, but you're going to be looking at water efficiencies in what you're doing. Uh, because most of the resources that we see here on the board are being teed up to be taxed on their use to try to restrict 
and value their use in production processes so that they're reallocated to more to higher higher uses. There's already a lot of literature out there that's looking at the efficiency of water use in food. Um, for instance, how many gallons of water does it take to make a quarter pound hamburger versus a head of lettuce? And you may be shocked to find out that the complete water use for the crops, the livestock, the processing, and all that stuff for a quarter pound hamburger, depending on which study or estimate that you look, are somewhere between 600 and 1,300 gallons. Okay, versus uh, something like a more vegetarian feed grain or food type diet, which uses a lot less water. And so it's not a coincidence that you see sort of the rise of um, prescriptions toward consuming less meat. And in fact, that meat uh, is being, meat production is being targeted as also a major contributor to global warming uh, through the emissions and so forth which take place. And so, um, uh, raising the cost of meat, which will inevitably happen in this industry, you're wondering when it's going to happen, but of course as, as the conditions under which you can produce food and sell it become more restricted, the price will go up. And that will restrict or reduce the use of these targeted global resources in what are considered inefficient uses. The same thing goes for uh, energy. There are studies out, believe it or not, quite a few of them now, that look at energy efficiency of food. In other words, what is the total energy input to produce French fries versus uh, a T-bone steak versus uh, fish or whatever? And as you can imagine, meat consumption really and meat production of all times is highly energy inefficient. And the way it's measured is the total amount of energy required versus the consumable calories, for instance, that the human can get out of them for, uh, for use. And it turns out to be very inefficient compared to uh, crops and fruits and vegetables and things like that. But of course, it's also a critical source of protein for a diet, but the amount of protein needed in the diet uh, is far exceeded by my consumption and yours, not only on a daily basis, but uh, uh, the one trip to Bojangles is enough for about a week's worth of protein probably in a diet, at least in mine. Okay, so um, those are the things which are being focused on in terms of policies direct that are going to be coming your way to try to ration, allocate uh, through market mechanisms and taxes and outright restrictions to reserve these global resources to make sure that they don't run out or they're not used um, in one generation when we have to preserve them for, a long, for the long term. So that's why you see the really growing trend for instance to try to rename the US Department of Agriculture to the US Department of Food and things like subsidizing not the production of food but the methods is one of sort of the megatrend suggestions that's on the table now. Throughout our history in the United States, at least in the last uh, hundred years, it's been coming out of the Depression era, kind of feast and famine, subsidized for plenty and abundance, which of course we responded to really in spades. But now the shift is focusing away from abundance and toward um, methods. So future subsidies for corn and that sort of stuff are politically trying to be redirected toward technologies that are used and whether or not regional and local uh, supply chains are exploited or whether the current situation like for the US pork industry is focused on exporting uh, great distances. Because, you know, the only way really this industry can grow in the United States is to use resources here and build its market globally. And, of course, there are lots of good reasons economically to do that that benefit all the parties and make everybody's wealth go up and nutrition go up. But the way that's being looked at now is a disproportionate use of global resources here, uh, not 
for the people here, but really then to export it to other places. And in that exportation, you have food miles accumulating, which is, of course, the, the shipments of the pork and containers blow off uh, uh, greenhouse gases and so on, which then cause impacts to everyone in the world. So private profit coming to you from expanding export markets is putting cost consequences on everybody else in the world. That's the argument that's coming forward. So abundance now is seen as a negative. Abundance causes obesity, right? Um, in fact, Earl Butts, the late Earl Butts, is the big demon in most of this literature. You know, he recommended planting fence row to fence row. And really, um, even in low price periods, which made everybody scratch their head, uh, but he still, he still did it because he saw that there was going to be this huge need in the world. It was a matter of getting the distribution right, but we, we had to get better and better at producing. So you have people really for the first time saying that the cost of food really needs to rise. It's too cheap in the United States. It's created you know, all these secondary impacts of obesity, health issues, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, high cost uh, issues in the, in the health care system, which now are, are spun off on other people uh, because everybody has to pay the higher cost of, of those sorts of things. And we could go on and on about the monoculture of corn and all those things which are beginning to rise, uh, rise in, in the world. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of those, but just to show you the list of future production cost increases that are sort of headed your way and what some of the rationales are for them. There are really um, you know, policies to reallocate feed grains to fuel raise the cost of meat. Uh, limiting technology like antibiotic use and uh, castration without anesthesia, uh, confinement of animals at the, at the level that they're typically done in modern production. Um, <clears throat> all of these things, uh, policies are being teed up to either restrict uh, structures in business and resource use and removing barriers to things like citizen suits. So that it's much more easy for citizens to force the government to um, execute the policies that it says that it has. You know, normally you can't sue the government uh, if they do something to you, but this relaxation has been given so that if people don't believe the EPA, for instance, is executing its mission properly, citizens can sue to force enforcement uh, of existing regulations. Then on the demand side, you really have the same sorts of things beginning to, have, beginning to happen. Um, one of the more, I think, what will become more effective over time is, for instance, HSUS, who I know you've heard a lot about, is making a big push toward relatively conservative Christian uh, pastors and congregations with the animal welfare uh, sort of pitch. And you really have a very eager community there in what I would call, what you might call evangelicals in the United States because what they're trying to do theologically is reposition themselves against the characterization of the past, which is that Christian theology, especially, uh, essentially, from the Genesis account, uh, when it's taken literally, allows humans to consider themselves superior to the rest of the world and to go out and have dominion over the world. And that dominion, the tag that's been put on that has been that uh, that meant you could exploit natural resources, use world resources, and so on. And it's completely ignored that there's a whole theology of stewardship and stuff that, that goes in that. But in trying to, uh, uh, to move away from that old sort of stereotypical tag on more fundamentalist or 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 evangelical Christianity, HSUS is, has a whole subset of their website uh, which is dedicated to materials for churches and so on to try to teach against modern industrial agriculture. And believe it or not, there's some papers and people on that site who are professors at uni uh, Christian universities that those universities are not hotbeds of liberal Christianity. Um, so they're getting alliances with uh, professors and theologians at relatively conservative uh, Christian universities 
to to make this move. And I just spot the, spotlight that one because it's a ground shift in the approach by HSUS, and it's becoming very effective. And as soon as you get the message sort of out into the pulpit with the ordinary folks, and so on, it carries a lot more weight because it carries a moral message uh, in an environment where people are there to hear a moral message, and it's reshaping uh, people's views of things. Then, you know, really all the rest of them, unfortunately, you'll never get to the thunderstorm if I don't get moving. But So that's, that's the big hole that's going to open, what I've just showed you there, unless uh, we begin to rethink how we're doing things long term in the industry. And these are not things you can do overnight. But I want to try to just seed you down with, a, with an idea that, that I think would be very, very useful for you. But being able to achieve substantially more with fewer resources is, in fact, a, uh, a real winning position here because there are going to be fewer resources available and they're going to be higher costs to you. And to the extent that you can achieve more with them, uh, you're going to be positioned uh, more as a solution to this problem rather than the cause of it over time. But, of course, there are a lot of things that have to change in that. I don't know how many of you, I know you've all heard the word precision's ag put together. It's really a crop sector phenomena. And most of you, if you're out here in North Carolina, may not have really seen it being executed in the same degree it is in the Midwest, where you have huge uh, you know, crop farms and stuff, a lot of stuff going on. But it's, it's really almost 20 years old now in crops, and it's escalating really in, its, uh, in the technology it's being employed and the way it's being used. And here, here are a couple things that I want you to think about in terms of precision agriculture. Um, and then we'll show you some pictures and take a look at some things. But the key here in this definition of, of precision agriculture is that uh, views of the production process while it's in progress, not viewing the results only afterwards, but viewing the production process while it's in and while it's in process in some unique and highly technical kinds of ways, uh, noticing variability and being able to understand variability, uh, in-field variability you see up there in, in italics, uh, and then respond to it while the production process is still going on. Uh, now, if you think about it in, in terms of pig production, all this is a little bit of an oversimplification, um, we know that we have a lot of variation in the production process, uh, but we don't have very good ways to look at it until we get to the end. For instance, um, you know, when I tell producers that in a thousand head finishing barn, the critical animals uh, that need to be impacted are the bottom 350 to 400. And they say, well, how the hell am I going to see 350 and 400 of the bottom animals because they're not really that far behind and they're all mixed in and going around. Yeah, I see the one that has the broken leg or the rough hair coat or whatever, but uh, how am I going to see 300 animals in there, the bottom side of the distribution, right? Well, we don't have right now the, the technologies to really monitor that very well, so in intervening at the critical time in the production process to impact those is not very efficient, not very efficiently done. And in fact, the vast majority of the producers really globally, and I've looked at millions of points of data in many countries on this issue, uh, don't monitor it at the end very effectively. Like anybody who simply uses kill sheets to look at their, um, their production really is not monitoring very much of the variability because they see the production out of a barn, for instance, sequentially over a three or four week period and by seeing it sequentially, you miss the big picture. And by seeing it summarized in a kill sheet, you do not see the individual data points. And in fact, they're hidden from you in the summaries that come from kill sheets. So I've come to call kill sheets receipts. They're not data, and they're not effective in the, in the analysis and correction of variation. They're simply receipts. So let's look at how the crop guys do it, and then I want to really make you think about this a little bit if I can. Which of those methods would you call precision irrigation? That is, uh, think about it as not wasting water resources. Yeah, 
Now, these are the traditional irrigation methods in California up on top. But look at the huge amount of waste that's involved there. Right? That's, those are, by the way, the low-cost solutions. Just run it into the field in furrows. And you got a lot of water going where it's not needed into the root zone and well beyond the root zone and running off at the end. And when you're spraying it up in the air there, you're putting it back into the clouds. You know, a lot of it back into the clouds, too. Now, look at the bottom where you have a wet zone around each plant where precious short uh, supply resources like water, which is getting more and more short in California, I think, as you all know, and in places like Australia and, and others where there, we've had sequential droughts, they're placing the resource in a precise way where it's needed into the root zone and not wasting it. So if, the, if I had a successful outcome at all from this presentation, it would be the next time you walk through a barn, you sort of make the analogy and look and think of this picture and wonder how much of what we're doing in barns today is like that top part and not the bottom and what we could, we could begin to do to start moving toward the bottom solution. Now, the bottom solution is more expensive, right? It does turn out to be more expensive, but it won't be once water taxation begins and, and some of those other things. Now, this is a picture for the new combine. Uh, and what I would suggest to you is, even though it isn't really the case because I have a couple of big crop farmer friends that that claim to exploit this technology and they still have a little bit of the old order thinking in them. Uh, but um, it's really an obsolete question for, for bigger players in crop agriculture in the U.S. today to say what is your yield per acre. Uh, they can give you that, but you see that ground that the combine's been over? If you haven't seen that before, that's a, a map that comes out of the combine that's showing the variable output of the ground that, that that combine is rolling over. And when you get done, you have like a contour map with blobs of color on it that show you not just the yield per acre, but the yield laid over soil subtypes which are mixed into the field and, and all that kind of stuff. And I want you to especially focus on that picture underneath the combine because that's that's the kind of precision then that they can develop in terms of their output and how they, what they do with that then is plan next year's production. But let's talk about what they can do while, while things are still on the fly. By the, the subtitle here is the right input, the right amount, the right time, the right place. So in a certain way it's analogous to the phase feeding that we do where, you know, 20 years ago when I was first kicking around on farms, there were like two diets maybe, right? Or there was uh, corn and something over there and the other thing, <laughs> maybe a little soybean meal or sow cubes or something, and the animals figured it out what they needed, of course, and did it like that. Then we kind of went crazy and had 20 finishing diets, uh, so they were not overfeeding protein or underfeeding and so on. Then we kind of went back to something more practical. But by employing uh, uh, satellite pictures and uh, collected, uh, automatically corrected weather information and sensors and all that sort of stuff, they see, while the crop is in progress, a whole bunch of layers of, of information that, then, that can be used then to, uh, to correct things on the fly. <laughs> so when that pesticide applicator or herbicide applicator or fertilizer applicator is going behind the, the tractor, it's not just dumping uh, a metered load. It's literally capable of following a map in the computer of the, of the combine and as it rolls over differential soil types, uh, put more or less of certain chemicals in on the fly based on the knowledge of the, the variability in the soil and the, and the soil types and so forth that are down there. Then with uh, instruments like this guy is using a GPS pack and color-coded maps, they can see where, for instance, fertilizer that's already been applied has either been leached away by rain or some other phenomena or was uh, inappropriately applied. And while the crop is still able to accept more, uh, 
in terms of the technology they got to deliver it, they can go back over and variably with the map that they have here loaded into the into the implement, they can go back and selectively re-fertilize just those parts that need to be fertilized. Okay? Now, that um, is, is a huge capability. It's certainly not fully exploited today by crop producers, <coughs> even though it's available to them. A lot of it's available to them. Uh, but it represents an understanding that there's variability in the production process and the need to attack variability while the, the situation is, is in play, not after the, the crop has been harvested, but also to see what happens after the crop is harvested and prepare for next year. So it really, it really amounts to changing a mindset away from sort of the pig into the distribution of what I'm selling. And I know some of you have, have already made that switch pretty effectively, but it's very difficult to do because Again, when you go out and look at pigs, if you visually inspect pigs, uh, you cannot see the distribution that's there visually. You see your, mind, your eye is immediately drawn to individual pigs, which may have some characteristic. You'll see a bite mark on a pig, and then bam, you're right down to the individual again, or you'll see scrapes on one, or you'll see a broken leg or an abscess, and you're away from seeing things as a distribution. Now, the, the, the problem then that what's masked from you is that low variance distributions, which is what we want, are masked to you in almost all production record systems because <coughs> we're looking only at average outcomes and we're missing the variance or the standard deviation. So when, when I ask you what your feed efficiency is, unless you tell me the mean and the standard deviation, you haven't given me very much critical information for improving your process. Because a lot of the work I've done where I've really taken a look at this in a hard way, I know that, um, or I'm reasonably certain that with the, the data that I'm able to get in the modeling that I'm doing, that feed efficiencies and average daily gains, which come from a narrower distribution of outcomes, are less costly. And you would miss those completely by just looking at averages. A 2.7 is a 2.7 is a 2.7, and it's not the case, okay? Now, opportunity going forward, like our crop brethren, is really in realizing, measuring, monitoring, and reducing variation. So I want to just show you how pervasive this is. I never forecast prices, saying that right into the camera, because, first of all, I was I had the proper training that tells you that it's impossible to actually do. Uh, price analysis was one of my fields in, in the PhD at Iowa State, and I learned that prices have a random walk and therefore you really can't uh, can't forecast them. So I don't do that, but my other good friend economists do, and I'm very happy that they do uh, because then I don't have to. <clears throat> but what I tried to do just to illustrate this point was, uh, somewhere around January or February, and I put it on my Swinecast blog <coughs> just to lay it out there so I couldn't be, you know, saying one thing and then claiming I didn't say it later. I forecasted the, uh, the cost of production for hogs for this year, just to illustrate this point. Because how many of us grew up for 10 or 15 years in this industry where cost of production was a point? You know, it was, if you were at 36 cents or 38 cents or whatever back in the good old days, you were pretty much a low-cost producer, right? And how many years did it stay right in that with just a couple of cents moving either way? And now it's so all over the board with the random shocks that are happening in the, in the crop world that we can't get a handle on what's good, what's bad, what's high, what's low. Uh, we just know ours is changing all the time, and it's... Uh, uh, you know, what is the new standard? Well, what I'm going to suggest to you is there is no new standard. That really we have to come to see cost of production as a distribution of potential outcomes for the year. And the way I forecasted it was, <coughs> here's where I broke my promise. I did have to forecast corn and bean meal prices in order to get into the cost of production. <laughs> now, I used a, uh, a very improper technique, which I frequently do, which is why I, I never publish anything. <coughs> I just help, try to help people make money instead of uh, publish things. And sometimes I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but to illustrate the principle, uh, 
after the ethanol jump in 2006 of corn prices, we don't have a long history now of corn prices with the ethanol mix in it. So I don't have a great data set uh, to use that, that shows sort of the long run price variability in corn in the new sort of way of things. So I took the last couple of years and the same thing for bean meal because we know that, that the impact was not just the corn because corn and soybeans are trade-offs in, in the corn belt and, and if people rush to plant corn to make the ethanol dollars, they don't plant beans. So bam, up goes the bean price too. So they're highly correlated and interrelated. If you looked at 2005 through 2008, <coughs> well, it didn't copy over very well, corn prices ranged in Iowa from $1.56 to $7.38, a range of $5.82 in that period. Okay? Now, translate that into your cost of production and try to tell me you're going to stick on $0.36 cents or something like that. Uh, soybean meal ranged from 148.70 to 459.50, a range of over $229. So, the USDA for 2009 in February came out with the estimate that they believed that the corn price was going to be in the range of 355 to four and a quarter this year, and bean meal would be 250 to 310 a ton. So, I accepted that as the mean forecast. And then I, incur I built a distribution based on the last couple of years. And then I worked those corn and soybean meal forecasts into a cost of production for hogs with a relatively simple but reasonably accurate uh, formula. Now, I go through a sort of a Monte Carlo simulation of a thousand trials through the computer where I ask it to pick a corn and a soybean meal price from the dis dis distribution and I run it into my cost of production contract. And I correlated the two distributions of corn and soybean meal so that when I pick, so that when I picked the corn price, it picked the soybean meal price that was in the same correlation as it has been historically because they do move together. These weren't independent forecasts. So I did that part right. You know, I did account for that. Here's the uh, what you get. So I came out and said on a carcass basis in February, the mean of this forecast is 67.72 for all of 2009. But, and that's what we're usually wanting to look at, but this is the way you've got to train your mind to think about your potential cost of production for a year. Where each one of those histogram bars is the probability of that price, that cost of production happening. So, up to 90 and 95 dollars a hundred weight in the carcass are possible but very low probability. Now why are they possible? Well, the, um, the shape of that distribution that you see up there is the shape of the corn and soybean meal prices coming into your cost of production. And why is it shaped like this? Because there are certain shocks related to a drought or a government policy change which temporarily shoot prices way up, but typically for not very long, and then uses either economized or the next harvest comes in or whatever and they come back. So this, you'll see that you have a much higher probability to have a very high cost of production than you have to have a very low cost of production. But it's still small. The big density of the probable outcomes are in this area. Okay. But notice that you don't have that same long tail over here where, gee, you could get really cheap in, in your cost of production. So there, there are a lot of stories in there that you can think about and learn about. And one of the things that, that if you think of it in these terms, it will prevent you when we have another $8 spike in corn from going into ultra fear mode and locking that in for a couple of years since it might go to 12 right? Which has happened. And, uh, you know, certain poultry producers hit the reef uh, when they did that. And, you know, when you're in the middle of the fear and, and all that, obviously, um, I'm not second-guessing any of their decisions. But what I'm saying is we also know what, that when corn prices get that high, they generally cannot be sustained in the uses that they have. So there will be massive economization uh, alternates uh, found that doesn't happen overnight, but it happens pretty fast. 
right? Because the pass through in something like pork doesn't happen overnight, and um, there's got to be uh, some ways to account for it. All right, that's seeing that as a distribution. So, what's the focus for the future? The focus is, like with precision agriculture, to set into place strategies which narrow the variance of your outcome. Not only in the production process of pounds out the door and quality of pork produced, but putting strategies in place that don't eliminate the, out, the variance down to a point, but that effectively reduce variation in your cost of production and, I'm going to argue, also in your revenue side. So combined with a strategy on the, on the price side, you can get a margin outcome which is narrower than the full risk of cost of production and price of pork just fully experienced by being open to the market. So, I'm going to tell you again, and this time I can tell you with the, I always had the certainty, but I think I have more power in my punch this time, that all of the metrics that we're used to following really roll up in the profit. And I call it one ball juggling now when I see people focusing on stuff like feed efficiency and average data gain. Now, that doesn't mean that feed efficiency can't be improved if you're wasting feed and stuff like that, and you should always focus on, on not wasting stuff. But folks who measure the long-run sustainability of their operation by benchmarking average outcomes along those uh, metrics without any knowledge of profitability or benchmarking profitability to other systems are, not, are being led down a path that won't work in the future. Okay, It worked while the industry was dramatically changing its size and structure because you didn't have to be really good to lower your costs when you got bigger in the 90s. And of course people were and they got better over time, but just scale alone brought such huge economies that uh, you know, it covered a multitude of other sins for a while. So since everything rolls up in the profits, profit is the metric to follow. So let's take a look at it on the revenue side. We looked at the cost of production side. And you've seen this, what I call the Mayan Temple of Doom packer pricing. <laughs> Have you ever been to Cancun and taken the side trip over to the, you know, the Aztec Temple? Remember at the top, they cut the beating hearts out and held them up, <laughs> which is how most Midwest producers think of what their packers do to them. <laughs> So I, I call the pricing the, uh, the Mayan Temple of Doom or the Aztec Temple of Doom. You know that it goes down really on both sides. I'd put it just on this side on the high end as the animal becomes less and less valuable in the wholesale market as meat. And we also know that cost of gain rises, maybe not at that rate, that's an illustration, but we know as the animal gets bigger, the cost of putting another pound on it is, is more. Now what is the instinctual idea in somebody's head if I ask them, what is the weight that the animal should be produced at, or what is your target weight for your farm? Well, they usually like to pick that point, right? Why? Because if they go one more pound, they're going to get sort loss kick. And so I want to get it as big as I can just before it's going to be discounted. Because that, in the way the, the rationale is, I get more throughput, more pounds on each animal, and I take it up to the point where I don't get nicked. And they realize that even though you're getting the same price in that flat part on the top, you're not getting as many pounds out the door at that price. So let's move it all the way up there. That's the way people instinctively think about the profit optimizing decision. Now they don't act that way, of course, uh, when the rubber hits the road, because what happens is, <clears throat> You're not selling individual pigs, you're selling distributions of pigs. Even if you look at a truckload as 170 pigs or whatever, 200 pigs, whatever goes on your truck. And if you set the average at that weight, what happens? You know, you got way too many pigs that are heavy. Now, and most packer data comes back normally distributed because there's a selection process to go on the truck that says, 
that misses a little bit on either side. So even though we don't, we know they don't grow in the barn according to a normal distribution. If you wait them the day before slaughter, that you wouldn't get a normal distribution. The packing data most often comes back as normally distributed. And so you got equal numbers of animals on either side of this, and these are killed, right? So we know that that little line is not the right solution for truckloads and months and weeks of production that have to go. And what we've been able to discover, which is really fascinating is, at least to me, the optimal weight for a group of pigs or a month's worth of pigs that's coming out of the production process is generating this distribution of pigs is going to be lower than the solution for a single pig. And in fact, the wider the variance in the weights of pigs that you're producing, the lower will be the optimal target weight. Right? So the wider the variance in weights, if you solve it mathematically, the profit optimal average weight for the distribution, it's going to be lower. And you can see that very easily when you think about it because the wider the distribution, the more the tails are going to be poking into the Mayan Temple of Doom steps, right? So if you can bring the tails in, you can move the distribution up because this tail won't be getting into the steps as fast. I struggled a long time with this because people um, told me they, they got it after the third time they saw it. So when I put these sliding things in place that you're going to see now, my objective was I'm going to put it in such a way that everybody gets it the first time. Right? But here's the other, another thing to consider. If in fact for the distribution, even. Uh, this is the optimal weight where that black line is. Or let's take it first as a single pig. We know that if that's the single pig optimum, we got a lot of outcomes that aren't profit optimal, right, on an individual pig basis. These are all below the target weight. These are above the target weight. And in fact, if you even give it a five pound range, uh, only 2 or 3% of the total pigs will fit in that profit optimal slice. So we got 97% of pigs that are out of profit optimization. Now, the problem is, the only data you really get about valuing that, most people get, is this report from the packer that said these are nicked because they're, they're too heavy. Or you'll get that side too. But what you don't get is any report that tells you what's the lost opportunity here. So what do people do? They instinctively respond to the sequential packer reports that are showing them sort loss on the pigs by trying to eliminate it. And they do that by moving the average weight of the distribution back until the sequentially coming in kill sheets show low sort loss. The problem, of course, with that is you have moved your distribution down and all these pigs that were already had leftover opportunity in them when they went to the packing plant now have even more leftover opportunity in them. Only responding to this little piece you see of the information you get. So we don't have record systems that give us distributional outcomes so that we can compare that to the packer side which is giving us something every day about pigs that were too big or too little and we missed that mass and the impact of that unexploited un, uh, uh, opportunity in the middle. So, we're coming to the end here. Get ready for the thunder. <laughs> we're going to focus first on profit maximization, not packer discounts. Packer discounts roll up into profit optimization. So if we focus on profit optimization, we are going to be account we're already going to be accounting for sort loss. It's already woven in there. And in a point in time where you can't affect feed efficiency by genetic change or feed changes or effectively change standard operating procedures to really get waste released or whatever from the system, uh, in a short period of time, if you get the optimal average weight right, the feed efficiency and ADG that occur at that point are the profit optimal feed efficiency and ADG for your system at that point in time. These are... Um, Joint, jointly determined as you factor them all in and go for the highest level of profitability. So they're not separable questions in the short run, are separated questions. 
So here's an illustration just to show you. This is a map of 10,000 pigs in a distribution of actual farm data. Um, and we're looking at return over feed costs. So you've got 10,000 red dots up there. <clears throat> and this is what they look like given the weight of the carcass and the producer selected average weight of 218 pound carcass, which is a 280 or so, 83 pound uh, pig. Now, what I would like to show you is if you didn't do anything to that distribution except move it to the point where profits were optimized, you would move it from 218 down to 199. All right, and what you would be doing, I don't know if you noticed, I'll go back and forth, we pulled all these Mayan Temple of Doom pigs back up, you see, in price and value, and of course some of these begin to slide here, but by taking into account every pig in a modeling situation, we can set that just to the point where if we moved it up one pound or down one pound on average, we'd make less. You can really see the stair steps of the Mayan Temple of Doom in the red dots, can't you? I mean, uh, those are animals that are priced, uh, you know, gradually lower as they got lighter. Now, here's the other thing that comes to the precision agriculture in the crops. If we left the weight at 218, but put into an effect, put into effect policies which can be better sorting or some interventions in the growth process of the pig that reduce standard deviation of the end outcome by 30%. This is what the distribution begins to look like. And at 218 pound carcasses, the way it was initially done, this is about a 350 ahead improvement, even at the same weight. Now we know it's too heavy too, but a 30% reduction in standard deviation, which is achievable by many farms, most farms that I see that are in that weight range, um, 350 a hit. And what I did was put the initial situation back to kind of toggle back and forth so you could see. That's the same weight. Oops, am I going the right way? Yeah, the scale changes, but I want you to look at the clump. See the spread there in the initial situation and how the bigger ones are starting to go downhill? Then we've moved them back up. They're above the, the situa the, above the, uh, that situation. Now, this is the finalized situation where we improved, we crunched in 30% of standard deviation and optimized the group weight-wise. And instead of 199, we now can go to 203 in the carcass because we've pulled the distribution in, uh, now we can move it up, the optimal weight actually moves up four pounds in the carcass uh, because that tail is not hitting in to the discount period. Now, most people try to handle this that I work with and begin to show them this and report it weekly. Most people try to do it by, by really going after the people who are selecting the pig. And that's rightly so, because no matter how good you think that's being done, when you really look at scatter plots of what gets out of your farm, it's kind of like me and my diet. Man, I didn't eat a thing today. How did this? Oh, yeah, there was. I did stop at Bojangles. I forgot. <laughs> it was breakfast. Breakfast at Bojangles. Uh, but it was a long time ago. I forgot. When you really account for everything, there's more variation there than you believe. However, it can't, you can't have production processes, vaccination protocols, disease issues going on, which cause more variation, and expect to only handle it at the end where you put all the pressure on the people sorting. It has to be both an exogenous kind of approach there where somebody from the outside comes in and sorts the pigs better, but also an endogenous process where you begin to affect what's going on in the production process to bring what is unavoidable natural variation, just don't add to it. And we know things like feed out events and all that add to those di distributions. So those distributions that you saw have very different costs, very different revenue, very different profits. Here's one way to visualize variation. 
And I've kind of constructed this. Remember the combine and the field map? This is your field map for your production system in a sense. And this is the number of animals that are hitting in every cell in the matrix. The initial marketed situation is down below here. And, you know, I've, I've really been doing this for two or three years now on a pretty extensive basis, and I don't know this because I'm not a scientific person. I'm just the person that tries to help people make more money. <laughs> uh, and I squish on the science a little bit from time to time. Um, I'm well trained in it. I just squish on it because, unfortunately, you can't get proper scientific data most of the time in the situations that I work in. <laughs> so you got to use intuition. Um, but there are patterns that appear. You can begin to lay grids on this, field map grids, so to speak, because we know that what is the characteristic of these animals? You know, they're relatively lean, but they're light, too light. These are animals that were clearly missed by whoever was sorting. Okay, and if you sort of divide, kind of classically divide this up into six areas, and we begin to look at the distribution of animals in each area and what the action plan might be for each one of those six areas. And in fact, you can establish an opportunity cost on each one of those animals and then look at the total opportunity cost in each one of those six parts of the map. Now, how I generally establish the opportunity cost is I, I don't pick the optimal pig but I pick a targeted range where the most money is being made, and I look at the average return over feed costs, for instance, there, and then I subtract the outcome of every individual pig from that average in the targeted range to see what opportunity might possibly be left in that, in that individual pig. Then you can map the opportunity in this space also and grid it out. The top one is 30% reduction in standard deviation, and notice we moved the central mass from the 218 average range here back to the optimal 203 in this particular case with the feed costs and, the, and so forth. So see, you can have field maps, just like the precision agriculture guys. So this is my last slide. Get your umbrellas. Thank God, somebody said. <laughs> Measuring and controlling variance is the key really to future profitability because I guarantee you when you look at those two field maps that we just looked at, the resource use in one of them is a lot different than the resource use in the other one. And the value created is greater with less resources. Now whenever you can get greater value and less resources, um, that's huge, especially in an industry that thinks of itself as mature and has captured all the cost efficiencies and stuff like that than you can possibly get. So we know that, for instance, endogenously in the production process, what's going on as the pigs are growing, uh, if, at least if you believe John Dean and I do, disease is probably the number one <coughs> cause of added variation in, in the production process. Um, so. Focusing on healthy, getting pigs healthy is good. Now, we also know that healthy pigs develop certain variations, which are sort of interesting. When you get them well, the top end takes off like crazy. So this is a, this is a scientific endeavor. This is not a, let's just make them real healthy and everything will be all right. There's a lot of information to manage and correct. Uh, we know that feed-out events. Feed-out events in the literature that I see published normally talk about changes in average daily gain and or mortality, but you're only given the average. You know, average daily gain typically falls from X to Y in trials where they have feed out events. Uh, and ulcers increases and death loss can increase in bigger pigs. But what you never see in those studies, unfortunately, because it's impractical to do, is how does it change the variation uh, what, is the, what is the distribution around those two average ADGs? Did it in fact not only decrease the average data gain, but widen the variance around it? That would be a double bang hit on cost of production. You see, not just the loss of the growth, but the widening of the growth rate. So that's the kind of stuff we're going to have to come up with to use less resources in a world where resource use is going to be restricted and taxed. Um, we also know one of the reasons we went to case ready in the meat case, why? Well, you have a 75 store chain that each, that had a grocer, had a butcher in every store chain. 
you know, the meat market is a guy that really knows what he's doing in the meat market as a butcher can, can really sing in terms of profitability. But you have a distribution of skills in 75 stores. So you got 30% of them that are having waste, they don't know how to rework the product, they don't know how to pre do the presentation exactly right, they overorder when it's going to rain and stuff doesn't get bought. So if we get rid of 75 decision makers and put it into a plant where we have standardized cuts and, and you know deliver the package, all you really got to do is set them in the case and make sure they're refrigerated and clean up the case every once in a while, you dramatically reduce variation. Well, when we got production systems that have huge numbers of decision makers taking care of animals and, and doing stuff, uh, like you know, large contract uh, systems, for instance. Now, I used to think contract systems automatically spin variants into the system, but it's not. I've seen some relatively large contract systems that have a, a outstanding performance comparatively in um, in say standard deviation management of the outcome. So I'm not just jumping on contract growers, but all I'm saying is the more people you got doing functions, the more you're gonna have a distribution of skills, abilities, and whatever. And unless you have practices which help standardize that rigorously, um, or we've seen many production companies take back certain key functions that were in the hands of contract growers so that they can stabilize the outcome. Uh, which is another strategy to pull back certain critical functions. Um, systems built five to 20 years ago, I see this all over the place because uh, uh, pigs per sow per year has grown so dramatically. Uh, a lot of those systems are, are overcrowded now in the finishing and they haven't added finishing or really been able to get good quality additional finishing space and they wind up with um, lots of very odd strategies for how to manage that. Uh, which add variation to the process over time. And then market selection mechanisms in our industry are just really crude at best. There's got to be a real, I mean selecting individual pigs for market. Uh, you know, the auto sort thing seemed to have a lot of possibilities, but a lot of people got nervous about the average data gain issues and the early ones, uh, especially if they're being managed again by contract growers that weren't being serviced regularly and properly they would break and then not be fixed for a week or two and you know this stuff like that so their performance was being degraded but uh, you know we're trying to get better with you know kind of strapping pigs and to estimate their size and different things like that but for the most part in this industry it's a visual appraisal and because of the numbers of pigs that have to be selected the visual appraisal is spread over a lot of people. And in systems, especially in the Midwest, that have gotten a little bit larger and they allow the contract grower to do all the selection, you got the meat market guy again. Some of them are really good at it, some of them are not, and they're only doing it two times a year in a wean to finish building, so they never get the daily practice. Um, let me see. So I've seen distributions of outcome in, in those systems that some contract growers are consistently marketing 265 pound pigs with a 13 pound standard deviation, which is very low, uh, up to 30 in the same system. And so you, you have a distribution of capabilities that are out there. So focusing on variance reduction is the key to profitability in a mature industry which is focused on averages and got the averages in place, but have had the variation and the distributions hidden from them because of the impracticalities of how we are doing things. Impracticalities have to yield to innovation and you know the focus on single uh, metrics instead of profitability.